Well, good morning. Welcome one more time to Encounter, where you matter to us, you matter to God. I would come to church just for those bumper videos, I think. They're so much fun. Uh, there's so much behind that as well as we kick off a brand new series here at church called Summer Playlist. It's sort of a, a road trip themed series. As a lot of you know from being on them, every road trip needs, requires a good playlist to go along with it. More on that in just a moment. What would be helpful throughout this time together, especially this morning, is for you to think about uh, whatever journey it is that you're on or whatever, whatever adventure that God has brought you on. Um, just to frame it a little bit more, the founder of Patagonia, which I know has a few people who are fans, um, said one time that the word adventure is probably overused. He said, for me, uh, adventure, the adventure begins when everything starts to go wrong. And I love that, that description, right, of, of the adventure beginning when everything goes wrong. There's probably a few people who have had adventures like that. I remember uh, I did when, uh, when my wife and I were first married 13 years ago, by the way, today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't fishing, but I guess, you know. Um, when we first got married and the internet was sort of in its, like, beginning stages, uh, we, we found a vehicle online that we're like, this is the one. We were young, we didn't have any money, and so we've been looking for a car forever. We finally found one. The only problem is that we were living in West Michigan, and the car was in Northern Virginia. No problem. We rented a car, picked it up at the airport. The only one that they had was a bright yellow Chevy Coupe, which is a little insight into uh, maybe our couple personality. We drove it one way, so we, we rented it one way. We're going to drop it off in Virginia and then drive the car that we're buying back up to Michigan. It's a, it's a fail-proof plan. The dealer promised me it was a great car. All right, so we get down to Virginia, and we look at this car, and it was around that same time that people were, like, warning each other about the, like, Katrina cars, they called them, because Hurricane Katrina had gone through the Gulf Coast, and a lot of the vehicles from that area were, like, relocated to other parts of the country to help sell. This car looked like it took a direct hit from a Category 5 storm. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Every panel on the car was either scratched, dented, or cracked. I opened up the trunk, and there was leaves and dirt inside at the dealership. There was mud spread through the headliner and the interior. I just had to try it four times in order to get it started. On the test drive, I could never even find third gear. I didn't even know that was possible. You could say that the adventure was just beginning. Remember, before smartphones. So I'm like borrowing a phone from the dealer we didn't buy a car from and like calling my brother back in West Michigan to say, hey, interwebs me a hotel room, would you? Like, I don't even know where I'm staying around here. And give me directions. I'm like writing it down. The adventure was beginning. But for the purpose this morning, you know, think less about maybe the last road trip, and maybe the, the bigger season journey that God has brought you on. The, the big adventure that God has brought you on, particularly when things start to go wrong, when you start to get frustrated, when you start to get discouraged, when maybe you get bored. Maybe the journey that God has brought you on is one of, of discovering yourself for the first time. Because I think it's possible that throughout those junior high, high school years, everybody, the rough years, but the, the benefit is everybody tells you who you are, right? You don't have to wonder, who am I? They tell you, uh, you're, the, you're the smart kid, you're the drama person, you're the athletic one, you're the nerd or you're the geek. Nerds and geek can tell you the difference. You know, we can tell you who you are. Right? And now maybe you're two semesters away from graduation. You're going, oh my goodness, I have to figure out who I am for the very first time in my whole life. Maybe the journey that God has brought you on, this adventure that God is bringing you on, is one of sameness. As same house, same job, same car, same spouse, same kids, same everything, same TV shows. They run The Bachelorette all year, and The Bachelorette all year long. You never have to find anything new to watch. It's the same shows. And maybe it's in like that journey of sameness that your heart starts to wander and starts to look for a new adventure. Like what's the, the journey that God brought you on? Maybe it's simply for caring for aging parents. You know, for so long they invested into you, they poured into you. They were the ones that you went to for encouragement, that you went to for wisdom. 
and now you're in this journey season when you have to make some really critical decisions on their part, right? And it's not easy. It's heart wrenching, especially to watch somebody's health kind of go up and down and up and down, but more down than up, and you kind of know where it's heading. The journey <laughs> that God brought you on. Uh, two, two questions I think are going to be helpful for this morning. Number one, what is the journey adventure that God is bringing you on? And number two, where does your heart go when you begin to get discouraged, frustrated, or bored? What's the journey and where does your heart go when things go wrong? Kind of keeping that in mind, I want to invite everybody to, uh, to find a Bible passage, Psalm 121. The page number is in the, uh, is in the program. It'd be cool if you, if you had a phone, you could like, look at it on that way. You could pull out a Bible. We're going to do something a little bit different and start to talk like, around the passage to really get what's inside of the passage a little bit later on. The words are going to be on the screen behind me. Before we read the, the verses of the passage this morning, I just want to highlight one of the things that we very rarely notice. Uh, which is, it says in most Bibles, big letters like Psalm 121. And then right beneath that, in a lot of Bibles, it's tiny. Sometimes it's italicized. It's really something easy to skip over. And it simply says, a song of what? Help me out. A sense. A song of a sense. That little description, and lots of Psalms have them, not all, but lots of them. Uh, that little description is called a superscription. Now pay attention because it might be a Jeopardy question at some point. You can impress your friends. That's a superscription. A lot of psalms have it. Psalm 102 has a superscription that says, A Song for the Afflicted, which I'm sure is a peppy number. Uh, psalm 88 says, uh, A Song of the Sons of Korah, which is the very first rock band in human history. This, song says, this psalm says, A Song of Ascent. Ascent simply means, like, right, go higher, go up. So I want us to notice something. A lot of speculation around these songs, uh, that, that what they are. There's 15 songs of ascent is the superscription. Um, going up, some people have speculated. There's 15 songs of ascent. There's 15 steps going up to the temple. Maybe it was something for the priest to sing a song at each step on the way up. Probably not, though. What's almost certain is the case is that Jerusalem as a city, as a capital city, was strategically located. It was something like uh, in between 2,000 to 3,300 feet above all of the surrounding areas below. Jerusalem is built on like a high, flat plain or, or maybe a low mountain even. I mean, you can imagine why you'd start to build a city there. It's strategic. It's hard to take it over, etc. A lot of the land around that time was actually below sea level around Jerusalem. So it's a, it a, uh, it a good strategic place to build a city. As a God follower a couple thousand years ago, you would be required as a, a Jewish person to go to the city of Jerusalem at least once a year, maybe three times if you were able for the Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths, and a Pentecost. You'd have to go, to, it doesn't matter what those are about, you'd have to go there on a fairly regular basis. Now, in a time when they didn't think necessarily in terms of like north, south, uh, east, west, you wouldn't notice driving an elevation change of 2,000 feet over 60 miles coming from Galilee, let's say. You would if you were hiking. <laughs> if, you were, if you were walking on foot, particularly with your family in tow, and there was an elevation change of a couple thousand feet on the journey, you weren't almost never going downhill. You are almost always going uphill on the way to Jerusalem. My point behind all of this is whether you came from the north, south, east, or west, it didn't matter. You didn't go over to Jerusalem. You went up to Jerusalem all the time. And so the assumption behind this whole text, these songs of ascent, and even this summer playlist, is on their journey ascending, going up to Jerusalem. I don't think the people then were much different than the people today. They would talk. They would also listen to music. They did not have a streaming service, FM radio, or even a mixtape. They had their voices along the journey 
they would sing. The songs that they would sing were the songs of ascent heading up to Jerusalem on their way. And when they went, they would never go alone. Some of you have heard this story in the past about uh, Jesus getting left at the temple in Jerusalem by his parents. He got home alone, right? You get the reference? I mean, the uh, mom like woke up like, Kevin, Jesus, like how do you, and you wonder, how do you leave your kid behind in Jerusalem? Particularly if that kid is God. Like how do you leave God behind, right? Oops. Um, I think the reason is as they would travel to Jerusalem, they'd go up to Jerusalem, ascending, um, they would travel not just with their family, their extended family, they'd travel sometimes with their whole villages. You would never go alone. You've got this massive entourage all heading up to Jerusalem. There's like a flood, a sea of cousins, and Jesus is presumably hanging out with them in the back. They don't realize he's gone until they settle down for the night, and they're like, oh man, now we've got to go back and get Jesus back in Jerusalem, right? They're traveling together, heading up to Jerusalem, and they're all singing together these songs, the playlist for the journey. I want to read part of, you, part of it for you now. It says this, uh, Psalm 121, starting off in the first verse, it says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. You can already start to see like it's, a, it's an outdoors-themed journey psalm. A psalmist is going through and he sees the mountains heading up on either side and a dirt road like winding between them. Uh, something important to realize is mountains in those days were not a beautiful sight to take in. It was a sight that reminded them of danger. Uh, it was in the mountains, at the clefts, the caves. Thieves would be robbers, maybe worse, would hide out, uh, look for their next victim. In addition to that, it was known in those days, on top of the hills on the mountains, there was uh, shrines. Uh, they were dotted with shrines, uh, uh, offerings to the god deity Baal, who was the god of the, of the harvest, the god of the desert, of the field. I just want us to see, when the psalmist is writing through, I lift my eyes up and I see mountains. It doesn't evoke calm and safety. It invokes danger, fear, and things going wrong. And then he asks a question. He says, where does my help come from? I don't think it's nearly as rhetorical as what we think it is. No, seriously, where, where does my help come from? From the thieves, from the robbers, uh, from the bales, from the other gods, from the other nations around me. Uh, when I'm in a place when everything is going wrong, when I'm discouraged, when I'm frustrated, when I'm bored, when my heart begins to wander, where does my help come from? And then in verse 2, he answers himself. He says, uh, my help, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We're going to see this a, a couple times throughout the passage. He, like, marks off the boundaries, and it's just sort of assumed in a poetic way. It's, it's heaven, it's earth, it's everything in between. I think there's something in him that, like, needs to, to remind himself, particularly when he senses, when he sees danger surrounding him, and he goes, no, 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 my help comes from the Lord. I just need to tell myself that sometimes. My help still comes from the Lord. My help comes from the Lord. It does. My help comes from the Lord. I think he needs to remind himself of that because that's not the only option. What journey has God brought you on? And where does your heart turn when things go wrong, you get discouraged, frustrated, tired, or bored? God, the Lord, is not the only option on the table. I, I, I don't need to see a show of hands to keep them down, but like how many of you came home from a rough day? on the site, at the office, or whatever it was, you, you sat down in your favorite chair and you said to yourself, maybe audibly, I need a drink. <laughs> right? It's just one. Now, let's not make too big of a deal. How, how many of you, the rest of you maybe, uh, sit down in a chair after a long day, open up your phone, start flipping through Amazon, not because you're looking for something, but just because, and, and then you see something, one-click purchase, and you tell yourself, I deserve this. 
come on, Dirk, it's, it's, it's one. It doesn't make that much of a difference. Probably. But possibly it's one in a series. Possibly it's, it's the beginnings of a habit that your heart turns to because there's a gap or there's a void that's created among the journey, in the journey, when you get tired, bored, discouraged, frustrated, when things go wrong, a gap gets created, and your heart tries to, tries to fill it in with, with something, with anything, and it will take your life. Now, it, it may just be one, but let me just give you an example. Let me just get a reel to myself here. How many of you know what this is, right? There we go. Now the hands go up. It is a Super Nintendo Entertainment System controller, SNES. Love it. Um, this was not the one I wanted to bring, and the reason for that one is simple. Uh, my heart would go to a place almost instinctively. I remember a season in life when I became discouraged and tired, frustrated with friends, with school, with everything. And my heart would sort of naturally wander over to a uh, PlayStation video game console. And I would pick up a controller. I'd play a game, Final Fantasy VII. I still remembered it. Now, before you laugh at me, it's cool. All right, got a few fans. I see some nodding. I know who you are. All right, we'll talk afterwards. No, 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 it wasn't just a game. It was an immersive experience for me, especially when it first came out. It's an old game now. I know, it's fine. Um, but like, oh, man, to, to play this thing, I would forget where I was. I would forget what time it is. I would forget what day it is. Who's the president? How old am I? I don't know. It's like a casino with no clocks or windows. It just like time doesn't even matter anymore. You just get lost. In the game, I remember there was a ticker, like a timer in the corner. Elapsed time played on the game. Which was a bummer if they wanted to sell more games. Because I noticed this thing. And I remember vividly when it clicked over the 100-hour mark. And it, like, hit me. This thing is going to take my life. How easy that is. So I don't have the game anymore. And some of you are going, how could I go to a church where the pastor loves video games that much? <laughs> like, come, how cheesy is that? Choosing to surrender your life to a fantasy like that. Just a minute. I just got to check on something, right? <laughs> and you pick up a phone, and you start kind of like flipping through, and you watch other people live their lives instead of building one for yourself. And, and so I just, if it's not this thing, it might be this thing that your heart just kind of instinctively wanders towards, and you start like flipping through, Instagram, Facebook, like, like whatever it is. I just, I, I want you, I want to be clear, I don't want anybody to leave with the mistaken notion that this is any more of a fantasy than this is, regardless of the name. And these things, it will take your life if you're not careful. We remind ourselves, <laughs> when I get discouraged, or bored, frustrated, when things start to go wrong, my heart will try to numb the pain, avoid the pain, forget about it, get distracted intentionally. My heart will wander on the journey. Where does it go? Maybe you need to remind yourself, no, my help, it comes from the maker of heaven and earth and everything in between. I, I, I like the imagery. It's, it's, the, it's the outdoors kind of creation imagery that the psalmist writes about. You know, he sees the mountains, he sees the danger, and he sees the same God that created those mountains wants to help, is offering help. <laughs> I, I think of today, and I just, you know, the 
the unbelievable ingenuity of our Lord. Um, just imagine if you could uh, bumblebee, bone up a little bit extra big so you can see it real well in your mind. You know, and it, it's got the proportion and texture of a tennis ball. And it flies. <laughs> and you're like, how in the world does that thing take off? Like, in whose mind? In whose mind is this thing like, yeah, and you know what? The survival of everything living is going to depend on this thing, a bee. And you're like, seriously? That? Is a good plan? No, no, but it's, it's wings flap 200 times a second, the same rate as the RPMs of a small motorcycle. And that's how it flies, forward, backward, up, down, everything. And I think the psalmist is like reminding himself the same creativity, the same ingenuity, the same power and person that created that bumblebee, bumblebee and that mountain is on my side and wants to help. And I think to myself, God, you don't understand how everything went wrong. You don't understand how frustrated, how discouraged, how bored, or how tired I am. You don't understand, God, that this mess right here, there isn't a way out. And he's going, you haven't even begun to see the creativity and the power that is behind the creative force. That is my person. And you have access to me in the one, Jesus Christ, the very image of God. And he's like reminding himself on the journey in the danger. No, no, my help, it comes from the maker of heaven and earth. He's on my side. He's doing something. He hasn't abandoned me. He's on my side. But, but know this, know this. This is probably the most important part of today. Whenever they would travel, they would never, never travel alone. They would always go with a few others. In this case, they would probably go with their whole families, their whole village up to Jerusalem. And so in the one couple of verses, he says, my help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. And then in verse 3, is, the language kind of switches. Uh, I'll read it for you. Let me know if you pick it up here. In verse 3, it says, he will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Um, it's kind of a like side shade thing that they're heading through the dirt road and there's mountains and there's Baal shrines like dotting those mountains. Um, it, was, uh, it was widely known at the time, uh, Baal being a god of the harvest, uh, fertility, uh, the god of uh, the seasons and the desert and the fields as well, um, that in order to evoke Baal's favor on you, you'd have to dance and you'd have to offer sacrifices at the right time, at the season beginning, to, to wake him up because he's stirred. And I just love how they're like trolling the Baal worshippers heading through and going, yeah, but our God never slumbers. You hear, you hear that? <laughs> our God never sleeps. Our God never, three times in one, I thought it was interesting. They're going through, they're going through, and there's a, there's a language shift, isn't there? Did you pick it up? The first couple of verses, it says, where does my help come from? My help come. The first two verses, it's all first person, I, my. The rest of the psalm, all uh, the eight verses that follow, it's not I, my, it switches to you, your. I imagine the people wandering walking up towards Jerusalem. And one guy kind of sings out, I lift my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come from? And then a chorus of other believers answer, he will not let your foot sleep. He watches over you. He will not slumber. And then in verse 8, the Lord will watch over your coming and you're going and everything in between, both now and forevermore, and everything in between. If you take nothing else from our time together, I hope it's this. The psalmist reminded himself the journey that is on, where does his heart go? No, no, no. My heart comes, or my, my help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. It does. But he doesn't do it just by himself. No, he relies on a community of other people. Where was it again where my help comes from? And a chorus of other believers chimes in and says, May you never forget, church. Your help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. 
May you always know that he is the shade at your right hand. May you always be aware that he will not let your foot slip. That he will never let harm come to you. And the psalmist just goes, write down, write down, write down. A chorus of believers reminding the psalmist of what he already knows. But he just needs to hear it one more time. One more time until it finally sinks in. I heard a story about somebody who makes, um, who made bread, and that making bread is uh, is simple ingredient wise, but to do it by hand is an incredible amount of work. It takes an inordinate amount of oil, what you would think of, in the flour, and you're like kneading it and kneading it, and the oil, it looks like it's never going to sink in. It looks like it's never going to take, and you just have to do it again and again and again, and get your fingers in there, and get your thumbs in there, and just knead, 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 and then over a long period of time with enough pressure pushing, reminding again and again, finally the oil will sink in all throughout the bread. It'll take. Eventually, we just need to hear it again and again, and again. When he writes twice in those few verses that the Lord is watching, you're coming and you're going and everything in between, now and forevermore and everything in between. The, the, the image that you kind of get is like, yeah, he's, he's, he's watching you like a TSA agent at Ford International Airport. Put that, put that down. Not on the belt. Yeah. Take off, your, take off your shoes, you know? Like, no, no. It has a more agricultural sense. He's watching like a shepherd is watching over the sheep. He's watching like a farmer is watching over the harvest. He's watching, but he's also growing. He's watching, but he's also cultivating. He's watching, but he's also preparing. He's watching like a coach, you know? She watches her, her, her team practice and saying, no, no, I, I, want you to, I want you to do it like this. You'll be more successful later on. He's watching like a dad who so desperately wants his kids to grow up, cultivating them, growing them, stretching them to be a blessing to their future families, uh, to their communities, to their churches, to their businesses and organizations, really to, to the whole world. He's watching, he's growing, he's cultivating. And I just think some of you are in a season right now, and you need to hear that one more time. He's watching, he's growing, he's stretching, but he's cultivating you as well. He knows. You know, the thing of it is around here, and some of you who have gone here for a little while, you know that I've got this weird, like, hang-up over uh, this time when I'm on stage and I'm talking to you on a week-to-week -week basis. I don't like to call it a teaching. I, and I'm kind of weird about that, and I understand. Lots of people do, that's fine. The reason for that is uh, two things, really. Uh, number one is that I hope this is more. I hope that, that what you take out of this time is, is an encounter with God. I hope that, that God meets you here. Uh, that you meet God, you don't just learn a little bit more about him, right? Not, so not a teaching. But, but the other thing is, and this is something I haven't shared before, but it seems to me teaching is really predicated on sharing new information, and I really don't feel like I share all that new information with you on a week-to-week -week basis. To call it teaching would, would really be not quite hitting the bar or measuring up. I think that what I do from time to time here, the reason why you come here, the reason why you bring friends here, isn't to gather this new perspective or isn't to, to hear uh, these new things about God. I think what brings you in, why God brings you and your friends and everybody you might bring into this place in, is because you so desperately want them to be reminded and you so want to be reminded of yourselves of the truth that you already, in a sense, kind of know. This truth that you are loved to death and back. This truth that God cares so much. He not only created the ridiculous bumblebee that flies, but he also says that same creative power and ingenuity and person behind that is behind you too. And there is help, you know. You may be in a journey where, you're, where your heart is wandering far. It's discouraged, it's bored, it's tired. Things are going wrong. But there's help. He's still watching. He's still cultivating. He's still growing. 
He might still be stretching you. But he's watching. A few weeks ago, I reminded you all in the Dangerous Prayer series um, of the dangerous prayer, two words, break me. And I said, the funny thing is, being in ministry for a little while, I know that God tends to use your area, your unique kind of broken, to connect with other people experiencing that kind of broken. In other words, your area of deep hurt is probably, scary I know, but probably the area of your most effective ministry. And I've been talking to a, a young woman, I got permission to share the story about that, and we've been journeying together for a little while, and she, she has experienced immense amounts of hurt and broken. It doesn't matter what the details are, because everybody has it. But, but it's been hard. And, you know, and hearing that about God might be using this thing to, like, connect and to reach another person. <laughs> it's stuck. And she emailed me just a little while ago. And she said, uh, she said, just as I'm experiencing my new normal, or, or in other words, just as I'm experiencing the healing and the restoration that God is offering, just as I'm coming to this place of being okay, a friend of mine has just been struck with that exact same kind of broken, exact same kind of hurt. And I know my job is to remind her of what she already knows. God is there. He is watching. He may be growing. He may be stretching. He's cultivating. He is watching. So she sent this email, and it's really about you all. So I'd like to share, share it with you. She writes that encounter has been, all caps, a huge blessing and a place of healing for me. For one of the first times in my life, I, all caps, cannot wait for Sunday mornings to come every single week. And I am so grateful for that. So grateful for each one of you. I think one of the most powerful aspects of church, of Christian community, is the thing, the saying around here that we have, do life together. And what that means this morning is go out of here and find somebody to remind of where their help, where your help actually comes from. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we do have wandering, restless hearts, and they don't always end up in the best place. So God, this morning, we ask by your spirit that you tug us in a little bit closer. God, that you remind us in unique ways and you equip us through your, your supernatural ability to see how it is that you're still watching, you're still growing, you're still cultivating, you have not left us, you have not abandoned us, and nor will you, that God, you love us to death and back again. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen.